Given a pair of vectors a and b, and the angle theta between them, I hope that by now you are aware that we often use something called the scalar or dot product of a and b. It's defined using the lengths of a and b and the cosine of the angle between them. In my maths cast on the scalar product, I tried to make a point of showing you that it's defined this way because it happens that this particular combination of quantities often crops up in science and engineering. It's just a useful shorthand way of writing this combination of objects. Well, as it turns out, we quite often see this product with a sine instead of a cos of the angle theta. Let's look at a very simple place where this combination comes up. Here I've drawn a parallelogram whose sides are a and b. I'm going to mark on also the width of the parallelogram. I've called it w. Can you see that there's a right angle triangle there now? And so w in magnitude is equal to the length of b times the sine of theta. OK, now let's talk about the area of the parallelogram. The area is the length of the base times the width. That is, it's the magnitude of a times the quantity w. But if we now replace w by length of b sine theta, we see precisely the quantity I was talking about now at the top of the page. Well, OK so far. But now I hear you say the scalar product was a scalar. This quantity here is also a scalar. But the title of this maths cast is the vector product. What possible justification could we have for taking a quantity like this and making a vector out of it? And in any case, how would we do that? And what direction would the vector have? Well, there are many places in physics and engineering where we have to do exactly this. But one of the simplest concerns the volume of a three-dimensional box. Let's take my parallelogram now and pretend that it's the base of a three-dimensional figure. There it is, the base of my figure. Now I'm going to use another vector, c, in a different direction to both a and b, slanting from the bottom left upwards towards the right. That's the third side of the box that I'm drawing. I now need to just connect up all the corners. I'm not very good at drawing that freehand, but I hope you get the idea. An object like this with a base that's a parallelogram and parallel uh, faces is called a parallelopiped. Let's talk about the height of the parallelopiped. There it is. I've shown it with the vertical red line. And I've assumed that C, the vector forming the side of the parallelopiped, is slanting at an angle phi away from the vertical. We can write the magnitude of the height h as the length of c times cos of phi. Now that we've got the area of the base and the height of the figure, we can write down an expression for its volume, v. In fact, the volume is just the height times the area of the base. Let's write both those quantities in terms of the lengths of a, b and c. The height is length of c times cos phi, and the area is length a, length b, times sine theta. I'm going to regroup these quantities in a different order, and in a rather suggestive manner. Written this way, we see that the volume is a magnitude of a vector times another scalar quantity that I've put in brackets, times the cos of the angle between the vector c and the direction perpendicular to both a and b. If we could picture that quantity in brackets, length a, length b, sine theta, as a magnitude of a vector, then this thing would be a scalar product. I've called the vector in question capital A, and simply demanded that capital A should be a vector whose magnitude is length of little a, length of little b, sine theta. But of course its direction must be the direction of the height, that is vertically upwards. In fact, vertically and perp perpendicular to the base containing a and b. 
OK, let's say that again. It's important. This quantity capital A is a vector whose magnitude is the length of little a times the length of little b times the sine of the angle between and its direction is at 90 degrees to both the original little a and little b. In order that the volume is a positive quantity we also required that that capital A vector should be pointing up from the base rather than down. When we put all this together we realize that we've invented a new product of little a and little b. We call it a cross b and we name it the vector product. That's because it is a vector. OK, I've started to write that. a cross b is a vector whose magnitude is length a length b sine theta and whose direction is at 90 degrees to both the original a and b and in the context of our parallelepiped it's up rather than down. How can we formulate that condition more generally? Up rather than down. That's what we call the sense of the vector. We can define it by referring to something known commonly as the right hand rule. Well those are just words. What does it mean? Well actually you can picture this by using the fingers and thumb on your right hand by holding them at 90 degrees to each other. That's not so easy to draw though and it's quite hard to describe without drawing. So instead I'm going to use another analogy. Here's the picture we want to end up with. To make A cross B point up instead of down we can think of having a screwdriver that is rotating in our right hand from A towards B through the shorter of the angles that is the angle theta shown here. So from A towards B. So the screwdriver is rotating in the direction of the arrow that I've drawn here. In that case the screw is penetrating into the surface in the direction given by A cross B. That's what we mean by a right-handed system and it gives us the right sense for A cross B. Now we've probably almost forgotten it but all this arose in the context of the volume of the parallelepiped. We can now write down a very concise expression for the volume. The volume is the dot or scalar product of the sloping side C with another vector which is the cross product of the two vectors in the base A cross B. So long as we understand A cross B to be defined in the way above that is with the lengths the sine of the angle and the direction chosen perpendicular to A and B and with the correct sense then we have a simple expression for the volume in terms of the sides of the parallelepiped. As it turns out once we've defined the vector or cross product in this way then we start to see it appearing all over the place. One place where it makes a very frequent appearance is when we have angular velocity or angular momentum in a problem. It's also used though to define moments of forces. In fact it turns out that the cross product is useful wherever there is any kind of rotational effect included in the problem. I'm almost finished but I just want to draw your attention to one very important property of the cross product before I end. Let's reverse the order and consider B cross A instead of A cross B. If we reverse the order that means that we're rotating the screwdriver the other way from B towards A. That means that the screw now drives in the opposite direction. The magnitude of the vector product is still the same and it's still perpendicular to both A and B but it's opposite to what we had before. That means that B cross A is equal to negative A cross B. In other words the product is non-commutative vector product is not a commutative product. It's really important to remember that because it means that the order you write the vectors in is crucially important. You can get a problem wrong if you write them in the wrong order. That's quite different to numbers where six fives is the same as five sixes. It might well be the first time you've ever seen such a strange product though there are others. Matrix multiplication for example is also non-commutative. In the case of this vector product 
the presence of the minus sign there means that the product is actually what we call anti-commutative. You won't hear that word so often though. Well to finish let me summarize. We now have two products involving vectors. A dot B, which is a scalar, called the scalar product, and A cross B, which is a vector and is called the vector product. We must use the notation correctly. A dot for the scalar product and a cross for the vector product. And in this context it is also not a good idea to use a cross when you mean times. Also try to get out of the habit of saying A times B. You should read these things as A cross B or B cross A. In part 2 I will show you how to derive the form for the vector product when we know the components of A and B. In the case of the scalar product that was a really useful thing to do and we'll find that it's really useful here too. We'll then go on to look at some further properties of the cross product.